Okay, good morning, everyone. Hope your Memorial Day weekends are going well. Uh, welcome to our worship service this morning, whether you're online or here in person. We're so glad uh, that we get to worship together this morning. Uh, if you are new to us, my name is Jim Chung. I am the associate pastor here, and I just want to share with you just a little bit about our church. Our mission here is to introduce people to Jesus and to those who know Jesus to become more like him. And our vision is to carry out that mission by following Jesus Christ through worship, nurture, and outreach. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our church and the different ministries that we have, please check out our website, which you can find at scbcmd.org. Uh, to help you navigate the service today, please visit our Watch Live page, where you'll find the order of worship, the scripture passage for today, and the sermon notes as well. Um, as of yet, we do not have a designated time of giving during the service. However, if you'd like to worship through giving and you're here in person, uh, there is an offering box right outside the sanctuary. If you prefer to give online, uh, we invite you to go to our Give page, which outlines all the different ways that you can do that. Uh, we have a few announcements uh, to share with you outside of these, and so I'm just going to invite Curtis to come up and share about um, Father's Day. Hey, good morning, everybody. So listen up. On the 20th of this month, 20th of June, which is not this month no, yet. Not almost, almost, almost yeah. yeah. 20th of next month, Father's Day. Um, we just want to have a men's sing-along. It's nothing but fun is all we're going to do. We've got a couple of hymns uh, picked out, uh, hymns that you know, like the old rugged cross. Raise your hand if you don't know that. Okay, never mind. Um, and I'll fly away. I mean, how fun can that be? Anyway, just a couple of hymns we just want to sing. We just, we just want to have some men up here to get together on Father's Day. But you don't have to be a father. This is not Father's Day singing. This is men singing. Young men, old men, middle men. Hey, which group am I in? Anyway, <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, uh, so anyway, we're going we're gonna to meet about 9 o'clock that morning. So service starts at 9.30. We're going to meet at 9 just to run through them right quick and sing the part that you know or that you heard or that you grew up hearing your dad sing or whatever that is. Or if, it's, uh, if, if you're just going to make a joyful noise, then do that. That's what we want to do. Um, anyway, so we'll meet about 9. We'll run through them a couple of times, and then we're going to kick off the service at 9.30, uh, singing for, the, for everybody. So, and then we'll, we'll go back down and, and sit with everybody else. But anyway, I need to get a head count, though. So let Jim know. Uh, just shoot him an email, send him a text, give him a phone call, uh, go to his house, you know, just however it is you want to let him know. And uh, so anyway, but please let us know, though, so we can get a good count of, of how many guys we're going to have. So we're looking forward to it on Father's Day. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Curtis. I um, <laughs> hope to see you guys at my house then, apparently. <laughs> uh, we'll be uh, honoring our graduates sometime uh, in, uh, in June. So if you or a loved one have... Uh, graduated this past fall or uh, graduated or are graduating this spring, uh, please let me know. We want to include middle schoolers also who will be promoted to high school. Um, and let's see. Oh, we're also looking to start our children's ministry back up this summer. Uh, so if you're interested in helping with that, please get in touch with me uh, so that uh, we can get that up and going. Uh, we have a, a few people who have already come in and said that they've wanted to help. So uh, we need more people to come and volunteer for that. Um, if you're in the building this morning, in keeping with the ruling of our state and local leadership, social distancing and wearing masks will no longer be required in the morning worship service. However... Let's be respectful of those who are still masked and those who have not been vaccinated, especially our children. Um, all right, I think that's it. So let's please stand and greet one another in the love of Christ. And if you're watching online, please drop us a comment or a chat so that we can greet you too.
please pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, that in your word that you've revealed yourself, that you've revealed your will, that you've revealed Jesus Christ. And from your scriptures, Father, we discover that you offer the gift of salvation, of eternal life, that when we place our faith in Jesus and you save us, we are no longer in our sins, but in Christ. We are freed from death to life. So this morning we lift up our praises, our thanksgivings, our petitions, our offerings, and for some of us our uh, use of spiritual gifts uh, that you've given us for the education of this body in Christ. In all of this, in addition to the receiving of your word to us this morning, we pray that you would receive all honor, power, and glory in our worship of you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Such small sacrifice If not joined with my life I sing in vain tonight May the words I say And the things I do Make my life song sing
Knowing that my heart was true, let my life song sing to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let my life song sing to you. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, and I'm reading from the New American Standards Bible. Then he said unto me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, whose words you cannot understand. But I've sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be listening to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I've made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, hard as flint, I've made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words which I speak to you and listen closely. Go to the exiles the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says Lord God. Let us pray. God, we thank you 
for your unconditional love, your grace, and your mercy. We have faith in you, God. We lift up the sicknesses this morning, the health needs, the financial needs, the relationship problems. We lift these up to you, God, this morning. Be with all who are hurting this morning, particularly those who mourn the loss of a loved one. God, please be with Brother Gilbert Jefferson and Brother Ted Jackson and their families who have experienced significant loss this week. Give them your comfort and peace, God. It is in you that we have our trust. Keep us strong, Father. We ask you to be with Pastor Neil as he brings the message this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. words from that scripture. Hopefully, we are not the stubborn and obstinate <laughs> and flint-headed that uh, Ezekiel was warned about. So on that note, please stand and let's worship God as we sing, Here for You.
mighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. invite you to uh, reopen your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 3. And as we come to the Lord's word this morning, I'm going to ask you'll pray with me. Father, we thank you today that indeed we praise you and we worship you and we thank you. And Lord, we would want the general attitude of our hearts to be yes, Lord, yes. Father, whatever you desire for us, we would do. Wherever you would lead us, we would go. Father, whatever you charge us to do, we would be willing to do. Lord, not out of a sense of duty or obligation, but out of gratitude for what you have given to us through Jesus Christ. We are so grateful to you this morning for the salvation that he offers to everyone. That, Lord, by trusting in him and him alone, we can experience the forgiveness of our sin and the fullness and direction of life itself. Father, we thank you for your many, many, many blessings in our lives. Thank you for the privilege today of being able to join together and to worship with others. And Lord, we do not need to pray for your presence to be here. Lord, for you live inside us. What we do pray for is an awareness of your presence especially as we come to the scripture that you have given us. Help us to see through the pages of Ezekiel what you might say to us today. If we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we are going to continue our study in the book of Ezekiel that we're calling Exploring Ezekiel. And last week we looked at God's call of Ezekiel, a young priest who is living in captivity in Babylon, but who God calls to be a prophet. Now remember that his calling was connected to and came on the heels of a, of a pretty magnificent vision of the glory of God. And as we looked at Ezekiel's call last week, we made three observations that Ezekiel was commissioned by God, that Ezekiel was called to the people of God, and that Ezekiel was charged with the message of God. And so the second chapter ends with God telling Ezekiel to open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. But what Ezekiel is going to eat wasn't his favorite food or some kind of fine dining culinary delicacy. Because Ezekiel writes at the end of chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, And when I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. And when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. As I went through this chapter, I thought, I wish I had a better way to exegete this and, and give maybe some more clear points and transitions. But to me, there's kind of three main movements through this chapter. Uh, eating a scroll, going to a people, and watching out for them. 
So this morning, as we continue on to chapter 3, I want to begin with an observation, the absorption of the message. Look with me at verse 1. And then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with the scroll which I'm giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Have you ever noticed how babies like to put things in their mouths? Apparently it's uh, because oral exploration is a key developmental stage. So putting toys and other household objects in their mouths allows babies to discover and taste uh, the texture of different objects. And it's really even not uncommon for toddlers or preschoolers to put things in their mouths because they're still in that exploration stage and it helps them to understand about textures and shapes and, yes, taste. Now, I don't know if any of your children, when they were young, uh, ever ate, swallowed, or ingested something they shouldn't have, but ours did. And what they consumed ranged from the dusty, dirty, uh, disgusting to the dangerous, which ended us at the emergency room a few times. One summer, Nancy and I were visiting family in New Mexico, and I remember getting up that morning and in my daily devotional time, read the Sermon on the Mount. I laid my Bible down and went away for several hours, and when I came back, I noticed that sections of my Bible, specifically the Sermon on the Mount, uh, were torn and missing. And I suspected that the culprit was our toddler. And my suspicion was later confirmed during a routine diaper change. <laughs> my wife informed me that she had discovered the missing sections of the Sermon on the Mount, which our toddler had actually eaten. I don't think that's the picture here with Ezekiel. It's debatable that he is literally eating a scroll. Remember that this is a vision, but in this vision, he's told to fill his stomach and his body with the scroll that God gave him. And when he did eat it, Ezekiel says that it was sweet as honey in my mouth. It's kind of interesting because if you remember, the message on the scroll is a message of God's judgment against Judah for their sinfulness and disobedience, which Ezekiel said contains lamentations, mournings, and woe. But it's still God's word. The sweetness came from the source, God, not from the content of the words. Now, remember last week we talked about sweetness of God's word as a figure used elsewhere in the Bible. There's a very similar account that the Apostle John records in the book of Revelation where he writes, <clears throat> Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but your mouth in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And in my mouth it was as sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy against, again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Bitterness was the contrasting characteristic of the message because it contained severe judgment. And though God's word is often described as sweet, in this case, its truth was the declaration of a coming judgment that would be a bitter experience for rebellious people. Now, I don't want to move too far off of the immediate context here, but let me ask you a question. What is your experience with God's Word? Is it sweet or is it bitter? Is it a burden or is it a delight? A long, long time ago, I came across this comparison of three different kinds of Bible students. To the first, the Bible is like castor oil, bitter and hard to take. To the second, it is like shredded wheat, dry but nourishing. And to the third, it's like peaches and cream. You just can't get enough. Now, I realize that this 
comparison is probably dated. And some of you are saying, Castor, what? Uh, let me just say, I hope you get the point. God's word is sweet. It contains promises and assurances and, and wisdom and knowledge and direction and blessing. But it also warns and it convicts and reproves, admonishes, judges and condemns. There can be times when God's word, when the truth of his word is not just hard to hear and hard to accept, but it's hard to swallow. The author of Hebrews reminds us, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's word may not always tell you what you want to hear, but it will always tell you what you need to hear. And this is what Ezekiel is experiencing as God's prophet. This eating of the scroll was a, 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 not just a spiritual experience. He was told to feed his stomach and his body. And there's something personally and incarnational for Ezekiel which demonstrates this basic truth. Ezekiel must receive and internalize and digest the word of God before he could be the messenger of that word to the house of Israel. It required a complete assimilation of God's word, not some superficial or intellectual reading of it. Only when God's word had become a part of his being was the message given, and he needed to make it his message. Someone wrote, here's God's point. His word needs to be digested and consumed. Don't just nibble. Scarf it up. Pig out. Chow down. There used to be a Lipton ad and portrayed a bold and feisty image. And the punchline was this. This ain't no sippin' tea. Well, this ain't no sippin' book. The Bible's not finger food. You've got to chew on its message. There's the assimilation. And then I see, secondly, in this movement, the adaptation for the messenger. Look at verse 4. And then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speak or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many people's unintelligible speech or difficult language, whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet... The house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you since they're not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Now what God had initially told Ezekiel about the unresponsiveness of the nation is here again reinforced. And yet God makes it clear that Ezekiel is to speak to his own people. It's kind of interesting. Ezekiel is not going to be involved in international missions. It's not going to be a foreign missionary. He's not going to need an interpreter or have to learn a new language or adapt to a new culture. Granted, he, along with many others, are in a foreign country. And they're living as refugees on foreign soil. But this message is to his people. And his people aren't going to listen to him. Have you ever thought that sometimes the hardest people to share God's word with are your own people? Maybe even your friends and your family? Even Jesus experienced the rejection of those who were close to him. Matthew records in this gospel that Jesus came to his hometown and he began teaching them in their synagogues so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is, he, is his mother not called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Who's the there? His people. And if you think that his family had his back and came to his rescue... The Bible says, and he came home, and the crowds gathered again to such an extreme that they couldn't even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he's lost his senses. 
His own family thought he had lost his mind. Now, maybe you have a family member who does not get your commitment to Jesus. They don't understand your faith. And maybe you've even tried to share the gospel with them, and you were met with some resistance. They didn't want to hear it. The temptation might be to give up. But don't. Pray for them. Ask God for sensitivity. Ask him to give you the opportunity or maybe even someone else, the opportunity to have a gospel conversation with them. See, despite the rejection of his own people, Ezekiel was to still take God's message to listen. Listen to what God told Ezekiel in verse 8 and 9. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed of them, though they are a rebellious house. See, God promised to equip Ezekiel for the task. And listen, this isn't so much about a particular skill set as it is a strength of character. Ezekiel is going to face preaching not just to a tough crowd, but to a resistant, hard-hearted people who aren't going to hear what he has to say. And considering such a challenge, it would be completely reasonable and understandable for him to be afraid. In my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I believe that this is one of the reasons, if not perhaps the main reason, that Christians don't regularly share the gospel. They're afraid. When I was in Bible college, twice a year, classes were suspended, and the entire student body, plus the faculty, engaged in what was called day of evangelism. On the day of evangelism, you might go to uh, an airport, a college campus, the streets of D.C. to do open air campaign ministry. And I want to tell you that as a young believer, I loved Jesus, but I really wasn't very bold in sharing the gospel. And I was not looking forward to the day of evangelism because I was afraid. I chose to go along with a van load of fellow students to a local community college. Armed with the four spiritual law booklet, I scanned the campus for a potential subject, and I saw a young lady who I recognized as living in the same community I lived in. I figured, well, if, if I approached her, she might recognize who I am, and she probably wouldn't be able to beat me up if she didn't like what I had to say. So I approached her and said, hi, I'm on campus this afternoon, and we're getting people's opinion to this little booklet. Could I have a few minutes to read it to you and get yours? Amazingly, she agreed. We sat down, and I went through the four spiritual laws with her. And then I asked, you wouldn't want to trust Jesus as your Savior, would you? And despite a less than confident and poorly worded question, she said, yes, I would. And on that college campus, she prayed to receive Christ as her Savior. I've got to tell you that my attitude on the van ride back was completely different than when we went. I, I was experiencing a profound joy for two reasons. One, she had made a decision to trust Jesus as her Savior. And secondly, I had been obedient in sharing the gospel, even though I had initially been reluctant and afraid. But afraid of what? Why, why do we fear? Most of us are not going to experience the kind of rejection that Ezekiel was going to experience. But what was what's so powerful is that God said, I will make you and did make him strong for this task. Three times in these verses, it says that uh, is the word hardened is used. And that Hebrew word hardened, interestingly, is a part of Ezekiel's name, which means, by the way, God is my strength. The exiles are going to be a tough congregation, but Ezekiel is going to be a tougher preacher because God had made him hard and strong. And I'll tell you, the same is true for you and for me. 
Does that reluctance or that concern or that fear ever go away? Well, maybe not, but you know what? You take the step of faith and God will harden you for the moment. When God opens up an opportunity to share the gospel, to be a witness, to, to engage in a new ministry, he will provide the strength that you need. The third observation I make is, uh, relates to the arrival to the people. Look at verse 10. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all of my words which I will speak to you. And listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says the Lord God. And then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard a great rumbling sound behind me. Blessed be the glory of the Lord in his place. And I heard the sound of wings of the living beings touching one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them, and a great rumbling sound. <clears throat> So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went embittered in the rage of my spirit. And the hand of the Lord was strong on me. And then I came to the exiles who lived beside the river Chebar at Tel Abib. And I sat there seven days where they were living, causing consternation among them. Ezekiel becomes aware again of this angel-powered chariot on which the throne of God sits. He hears this great rustling sound. The, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, uses the word seismos, and that's a, that's a word we probably recognize. Seismology, the study of earthquakes and other things. I think it's interesting because that word can be translated shaking, uh, tempest, or earthquake. And the connection here with the Holy Spirit is significant, and, and it reminds me of the coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts where the scripture says, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Ezekiel explains that this rushing sound was the wings of the cherubim brushing against each other and the, and the movement of the wheels, possibly signifying that this vision is coming to the end and that this throne chariot of God is ready to move. Now, I have to tell you exactly what's happening is not something I think I completely understand. But it's doubtful that this is a literal physical transportation. Ezekiel wasn't levitated or beamed up and transported somewhere else, Star Trek notwithstanding. The Spirit took the prophet to a place among the captives by the river Kibar at Tel Aviv. That's not Tel Aviv. This was the same location identified in the very first verse where there only the river is mentioned. And Ezekiel says that I went embittered in the rage of my spirit, and the hand of the Lord was strong on me. I think it's an interesting admission of Ezekiel, because one thing's for certain, he's not a passive bystander. Now, I don't get that the feeling here is that he has a sense of reluctance like Moses or Jonah or others who initially reacted to God's call in their lives. I don't think Ezekiel's angry at God. I think he's angry with God. The word embittered carries the idea of anguish, not vindictiveness. God had just told Ezekiel to take into your heart all of my words. So I think it's very possible that the bitterness and this anger that he feels are the result of his feeling the same emotion towards Israel's sin as God does. Ezekiel sat with the people for seven days, causing consternation among them. And that might be a little misleading. It doesn't mean that Ezekiel caused the people alarm by silently sitting with him, but that he was alarmed, appalled, and astonished. And whether the seven days was a time of personal reflection for what had happened or what was to come, the character of the vision he had just seen or the awesomeness of the task before him, he sat there stunned, which leads to this other observation, the appointment as a protector. Look at verse 16. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. And when I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet 
If you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he will die in his sin. And his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous man should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself. These are pretty sobering words. Ezekiel's prophetic office is now being defined in the role of, uh, in terms of a sentry. A, a watchman is the Hebrew word which conveys the idea of being fully aware of a situation in order to gain some advantage or to keep from being surprised by the enemy. Watchmen in ancient times were sentinels stationed on city walls or hilltops, especially built watchtowers to warn the citizens of a, a city of danger. It was extremely important because the safety of the entire population rested on that watchman's diligence to carry out his task. In the same way, Ezekiel is God's watchman, and he's called to warn both the wicked and the righteous. And perhaps more than any other word, this describes the characteristic of Ezekiel's work. He's charged with spiritual guard duty to personally watch over individual souls. As a watchman, Ezekiel was to hear God's message and then warn the people. In Phuket, Thailand, 10-year-old Tilly Smith and her family were enjoying a day at Maikau Beach when the sea began to bubble and rush away from the shore. While the adults were merely curious, Tilly was petrified with fear. Mommy, we must get off of the beach now, she said. I think there's going to be a tsunami. The adults didn't even understand her warning until Tilly referred to it as a tidal wave. Once they understood, they believed her, and they evacuated the area. Minutes later, the water surged right over the beach and demolished everything in its path. The resort was destroyed, but that section of the beach was one of the few places along the shores of the Phuket where no one was killed or even seriously hurt. Tilly was praised for raising the alarm, but she gave credit to her geography teacher for his lesson on how earthquakes cause tsunamis. She explained, I was on the beach and the water started to go funny and I recognized what was happening and I had the feeling there was going to be a tsunami. <clears throat> the hotel manager said, I think it's phenomenal that Tilly's parents and the others on the beach are alive because she studied hard at school. She's a hero. Listen, a determined 10-year-old girl saved her parents and dozens of fellow vacationers from a deadly tsunami because she had studied a school geography lesson and then courageously spoke what she knew to be true. What about us? Is there a sense on which we take on the role of watchmen, that we courageously speak that which we know is true? I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say that we live in a world and a culture that, for the most part, does not accept the truth of God's word. Evil's tolerated, that which is wrong is accepted, and that which the Bible calls sin is embraced not only as normal, but even desirable. I think in many ways our world today is like that closing verse of the book of Judges. It fits us well. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. 
Paul went on to write to his young son in the faith, saying, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. You see, being a Christian not only means trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior, as the only way of being made right with God, but folks, it also means living under the authority of God's Word. While you and I have the assurance of eternal life in heaven, we know that those without Christ are headed to a much darker, different place. Eternal separations from God. And having that knowledge, in essence, makes us a watchman, guarded with the task of warning those who are unaware of what's coming. One person said, it is the responsibility of every Christian to make disciples and to warn of what living a sinful life leads to. This does not mean we are the watchmen over the whole world, nor are we all meant to be pastors who watch over an entire flock. But all those who have a firm knowledge of Scripture are watchmen of the unsaved around them, whether it's family, friends, co-workers, or even a complete stranger. We are all in the position to warn somebody about the perils of sin and lead them safely that we find in Christ. If we really care about the spiritual state of a person's soul, then it may demand confronting them with the truth of God's Word, whether they are receptive or not. You know, if you're asleep and your house is on fire, you don't want someone to let you sleep. You don't want someone to come in and softly whisper that you're in danger. If they really care about you, they're going to scream, wake up! Your house is on fire to the top of their lungs. Ezekiel was accountable for giving God's message, and the failure to do so made him culpable. While I realize that, that every person must make his or, her, his or her own decision about trusting Jesus, I find God's words to Ezekiel sobering. We're not responsible for how people respond to the gospel, but we are responsible for giving the message. We are to speak and not be silent. Now, in the remainder of the chapter, Ezekiel, interestingly, is told to go shut himself up in his house where he would be tied up with ropes so that he couldn't even be with the people. And in addition, God told him that he would make it so that Ezekiel would be unable to speak at all. That seems like a strange way to begin a prophetic ministry. As Elwell asked in the Evangelical Commentary of the Bible, how does a dumb, tongue-tied prophet under house confinement warn his people of impending danger? Now, whatever the reason or symbolic significance to God's word, let's skip all the way down to the last verse in verse 27. But when I speak to you, let me do that again. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, thus says the Lord. He who hears, let him hear. And he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are rebellious house. See, God's not going to be silent forever, and neither is Ezekiel. God's going to restore his ability to speak, and he's going to fulfill his role as God's messenger. Once that message, though, is faithfully given, the ball is in the court of those who hear. Ezekiel was tasked with the role of being a watchman, but once he, the warning was given, hearing the truth of God's word brought an accountability to the hearer. In his book, Let Me Tell You a Story, Life Lessons from Unexpected Places and Unlikely People, Tony Campolo gave this testimony. He says, too often we're guilty of being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We're embarrassed about bearing witness for fear that we might be violating the rules of social propriety. 
off our failure to talk about Jesus, cheat some of our friends out of the blessings that knowing him can bring. This became very clear to me when I attended a 10-year reunion of my high school class. It was fun to see many of my old friends who I hadn't seen for years. Then one of my friends pulled me aside. He had been one of my closest buddies in high school. We had played basketball together and ate lunch together most of the time. He told me that a year earlier, he had had the most fantastic experience of his life. He had become a Christian. He explained the change that had come over him and the new joy that he'd experienced because of being in a relationship with Christ. He went on and on and on about his new life in Jesus. And after his first pause, I interrupted him and said, Jerry, I'm glad to hear that you became a Christian. You know, I'm a Christian too. Jerry asked, really? When did you become a Christian? And I explained to him that I supposed it happened when I was a little boy. To this, he responded with a most intense question. If you were a Christian when we were in high school together, how come you never told me about Jesus? How come you never introduced me to Christ? Tony, Com Tony Campolo says, I didn't know what to say. God's message to Ezekiel is, but when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, thus says the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, again, we bow before you this morning to thank you for the message of the gospel that reached our own hearts. We thank you, Lord, for that moment in our lives where the Spirit of God made it possible for us to understand and to receive the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your family. Lord, for the, all of the blessings that come from knowing Jesus. But Father, this morning in the context of this prophet and in the context of this chapter, what we pray for, Lord, is that you would give us grace, give us boldness, give us strength, to be watchmen. Lord, that you would provide the opportunities for us to be able to share the truth of your word with people. And then, Lord, that we would be faithful in obeying you. Father, there are people in our circles of influence, perhaps family members, perhaps neighbors, co-workers, others, who do not know you. And what we pray for, Lord, is the opportunity to be able to share Christ with them. Lord, to be able to, if, if nothing else, to be able to share with them what you've done in our own lives. Lord, to help them understand how they too can have a relationship with you. Father, we think of the scripture which encourages us to be, be, to be ready, to give an answer for the hope that lies within, any, within us, of anyone who asks and Lord, we, we pray that your spirit would make us sensitive every single day of our lives to those opportunities that may come. Lord, for those that we know that we have talked to who have not received your word, Lord, who still have not trusted, we pray for them. We pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to woo them and work in their hearts and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And then, Lord, I pray for us as a church. I pray for wisdom that you would guide us and lead us as a witness here on this hill, in this community and around. That, Lord, that you would show us how to effectively communicate the good news of Jesus Christ to the people in our neighborhood. Lord, we thank you for your love. And we thank you for your faithfulness. And as we come to the end of this gathering today, I ask that the Holy Spirit might direct and lead us and guide us in the decisions that you would have us to make. If we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. When I ask if our praise team will come back up and lead us as we sing one more song, uh, simple words yet uh, 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 very meaningful, I think, uh, to tell the Lord that we're going to follow him. This morning, if you're here and you have never made that decision to trust Christ 
and you want to talk to someone about what that means, then I'm going to ask you'll slip out of your pew, meet me here at the front. We'll have someone who will take a few minutes uh, and explain that to you so that you can know for certain that Jesus is your Savior. Maybe there is another decision that you want to make publicly, and if that be the case, I encourage you to come. If you're watching us uh, uh, on, at home or online and you have a decision that you want to make, please go ahead and contact us right now through that medium that you're using, and we'll respond as quickly as we can. You've heard me say this before, so I'll say it again this morning, that worship is a response to what God's asking us to do. So what is it the Lord's asking you to do this day? And if there's any way at all that we can encourage you in your relationship with him, and you need to talk to someone, please come. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing. that to be our prayer this morning, that wherever you lead us, that we'll follow, that indeed through our lives each day, we continually just say, yes, Lord, yes. I thank you so much for um, this day. I thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. I thank you for every person who's here this morning. And Lord, I pray for each of us and for all of us that you would guide us and direct us throughout this day and throughout this week. We pray for, Lord, the opportunity to have gospel conversations with people. And we pray, Father, that you would lead us and direct us in all that we do. Thank you for the assurance that is ours in Jesus Christ. And thank you for this time where we can come together as a community and worship you. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.